explore one of the most popular topics in Bible prophecy. Many people who don't know anything else about Bible prophecy have all heard about the Magog invasion in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Many people are startled to discover there are other chapters in Ezekiel too. But in any case, the book of Ezekiel, full of the present uh, judgments on Jerusalem at that time, but then he outlines the future destinies of the nations focusing on the restoration of Israel. And that's also where we find another very famous prophecy in Ezekiel 37, the famed dry bones vision, which fortunately is interpreted for us in that passage. It's the regathering of the state of Israel and uh, the valley of dry bones. They're brought back to life in the flesh in that vision, and then later they'll be breathed with the Spirit of God in those two steps, actually. And uh, it's interesting in Isaiah 11, 11, we have a reference to the same thing with an interesting phrase in there. In Isaiah 11, 11, it says, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. And then it goes on. The second time. See, the first time was when they were regathered after the Babylonian captivity back in the uh, fifth century, fifth and sixth century. And, uh, but the second time, is what we're experiencing in our lifetime, the, the birth of a nation born in a day. And of course, so this passage in Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled in the first half of the 20th century with the restoration of Israel, the second time. Now, why is Israel to be restored? In chapter 36, there is an explanation that's fundamental to our understanding the events that are going to take place and that we're going to review tonight. So let's take a look at Ezekiel 36, starting at about verse 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, that's an expression that Ezekiel uses all through his passage of himself, <clears throat> saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings, their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land, for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. He's talking about the diaspora. And when they entered into the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. See, it's interesting. Every time Israel is not in the land, that's in effect uh, profaning the word of God because that's where they were supposed to be and they weren't. These are the people of the Lord and they're gone forth out of his land. But, God continues, but I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen whither they went. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. It's interesting. He's going to take care of them, not because they deserve it, but because his name is on the deal. I think that's fascinating. God continues, I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And we've been watching that in the second half of the 20th century and continuing. So the book of Ezekiel has the famous dry bones vision, chapters 36 and 37. It also concludes 
the for chapters 40 through 48 that finish the book of Israel deal with the millennium, the kingdom that God is going to set up on the planet earth through which he's going to rule the planet earth. The millennial temple is described, Ezekiel 40 through 48. Highly detailed. So it's not just a symbolic thing. It's a literal description. All nations, not just Israel, all nations are destined to worship there. Offerings and sacrifices will be resumed. This puzzles many scholars. One of the things to take a note here, that that millennial temple will only be open on Shabbat, on Saturday, and on new moons. That's interesting. But the point I'm getting at is there is a very key event that occurs after chapter 37 and before chapter 40. And that's chapter 38 and 39, specifically the Magog invasion. So we have the Valley of the Dry Bones in chapter 36 and 37, the millennium in 40 through 48. Between those, we have Gog and Magog. And that's exactly what we're going to explore in this briefing. This is famous for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's the occasion in which God himself intervenes to quell this ill-fated invasion by Magog and his allies. And the allies include Persia, Cush, Put, Libya, Gomer, Tagarma, Meshech, and Tubal. And the second reason it's so well known by so many, this passage, even though it was written over 2,500 years ago, seems to describe the use of nuclear weapons. And so, first of all, let's talk about what I'll call the Magog identity. Who on earth is Magog? See, Ezekiel 38 opens up, first three verses. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Well, the first thing we want to explore, why does the Bible always use these weird names? Everywhere you go, there are these Gog and Magog and so forth. There was a city many years ago called Petrograd. And then for many, many years, it was called St. Petersburg. Then for many years, it was called Leningrad. Now it's called St. Petersburg again. And um, what's it going to be called next year? My friends in Russia remind me that in Russia, even the past is uncertain. And so... In, uh, uh, there was a town called Byzantium that became the capital of the world when Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to uh, Byzantium and renamed it Constantinople as the New Rome. And uh, about a millennium and a half later, about 1,450 years later, the Muslims overran it and renamed it Istanbul. See, we keep changing the names of things. So what do you do if you're Isaiah... And God calls upon you to talk about the Persian Empire over a century before it surfaces in history. How do you refer to it? Well, by the ancestors. You call it Elam. In Isaiah 11 and 21 and 22, you'll find that. See, you and I change the names of everything, but there's one thing we don't change the names of, and that's our ancestors. So if you're going to try to talk about a people, biblically, then the safe way to refer to that people is by the name of their ancestors. And that's exactly what we have. We have Noah. All of us in this room are relatives. Did you know that? We, don't, we not only go back to Adam, we all go back to Noah. We're really relatives. Perhaps that's why we don't get along any better. But he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And their sons are detailed in Genesis 10 and also in 1 Chronicles 1. And obviously, we're going to be dealing with Magog, who's one of the sons of Japheth. He's a grandson of Noah himself. And there's many others that we'll be dealing with. But let's go back. Ezekiel wrote but in the, in the uh, 7th century B.C. There was a guy that wrote in the 8th century B.C., a guy by the name of Hesiod. And uh, he was a Greek poet who occupies a very unique place in Greek literature, for, both for his moral precepts and his highly personal tone. He was known in what's called a didactic poet. He wrote poetry that's intended to instruct, not just to entertain. He was born in Ascrab, Boeotia, which is now Fallopagania, for those of you that might be worried about that. 
<laughs> after his death of his after the death of his father, he settled in Nabaktas, and then in, in his youth he tended sheep and led the life of a farmer. Except for what he reveals of himself, we really know very little about his life. Modern scholars place him in the same period of Greek literature as Homer, with his Iliad and Odyssey and so forth. And he's credited with composing works in the days, the earliest example of didactic poetry, poetry meant to be instructive rather than entertaining. Now, the reason we bring him up is he speaks of the Magogians, the sons of Magog, by their Greek name, the Scythians. So he's a very early authority of the identity of, the, uh, of Magog. There's another guy that wrote a couple of hundred years later by the name of Herodotus. In fact, he is known as the father of history. Very, very prolific writer. He traveled extensively throughout the Mediterranean world and observing all the different peoples he encountered and studying the military history of the region. And uh, to the Greeks, they were very interested in that, and he, he, his, his uh, military background was very important to them. And he produced a narrative compilation of his findings, which he entitled History. And as I say, he's known as the father of history. A number of archaeological discoveries have clearly confirmed Herodotus' reports in general and his Scythian reports in particular. And uh, now there's another guy that you'll want to be aware of, and that's Philo Judaeus. He's sometimes called Philo of Alexandria. Now he's somewhat con almost contemporaneous with the New Testament period. Uh, he was considered one of the greatest Jewish philosophers of his age. And he appropriated so completely the doctrines of Greek philosophy that he's also considered really a Greek philosopher who combined elements uh, borrowed from both sides, if you will. And uh, he was born in Alexandria to a very wealthy aristocratic family, and he received his education in the Old Testament and in Greek literature, both. And uh, he had an intimate knowledge of Homer and the other Greek uh, writers, and, uh, but, uh, and his chief studies were Greek philosophy especially the teaching of the Pythagoreans and, the, uh, and Plato and the Stoics. Another authority that makes reference that we're going to refer to here is Josephus, or Flavius Josephus, Jewish historian born in Jerusalem of both royal and priestly background. His original name was Joseph ben Matthias, incidentally. He was a man both learned and worldly. He was a member of the Pharisees. And also a very public figure who, before the Jewish revolt against Rome, had made friends at the court of Emperor Nero. He uh, uh, felt that the uh, parts played by the zealots and, uh, and uh, their opponents, the Pharisees, considered the whole uh, uh, attempt to fight Rome futile. And uh, this led to ambiguity in the historical record of the role of Josephus, a Pharisee, uh, in the conflict. His own writings represent two conflicting accounts of his mission in the province of the Galilee. Two conflicting accounts. According to one account, he took command of the Jewish forces to lead a Galilean phase of the revolt. In another account, uh, it contends that he sought to subdue the revolt rather than to lead it. Whichever story may be true, uh, it apparently prepared the Galilee for the coming onslaught in the, in the year of 67, in which they uh, repulsed the advance of Vespasian, the Roman general, who was soon to become emperor, uh, defending the fortress of uh, Jatapata for about 47 days before surrendering. But here's where he gets very clever. He would have been sent as a prisoner to Nero had he not had the wit to prophesy that his captor, Vespasian, would himself one day be emperor. He predicted that, and Vespasian was. His son Titus was, would then take over. And this, uh, this of course, uh, is prophesying this, you know, accorded with Vespasian's ambitions. So the general kept Josephus with him, thus saving his life. And that while he was Vespasian's prisoner... He oversaw the, the, or he watched, the subjugation of Galilee and Judea. And he, subsequently he was freed, and he adopted Vespasian's family name, Flavius, as his own. That's where he gets that, that name. And uh, he then accompanied another emperor, namely Vespasian's son, Titus, and he witnesses Titus's uh, siege of Jerusalem, the famous fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So his records are of incredible value to us. And uh, so thereafter, he enjoyed imperial patronage under Titus and his brother's successor, Domitian. He lived until his death in Rome and devoted himself to his writing. Very prolific writer, wrote documents that are very important to us. His, his writings even record 
uh, the presence of Jesus Christ and also James, uh, Christ's brother. His works include the War of the Jews, that's seven volumes, the Antiquities of the Jews, uh, his summary of the whole history of uh, Judaism in 20 volumes, and uh, his own autobiography, and a rebuttal to some criticism before. The last one is invaluable because Josephus recapitulates the writings on Jewish history that we no longer have available. In his book Antiquities, the key first verse for us today is, he says, Magog founded the Magogians, thus named after him, but were by the Greeks called Scythian. So there again, we get the equivalency of the word Scythian with the biblical term of Magog. So that's the Magog identity. Hesiod, the Greek didactic poet in the 8th century, makes reference to it. Herodotus, the father of history, uh, says the, essentially the same thing. Philo and Josephus not only mention it, but they link that to the Great Wall of China, which was built to keep them out. They're, they use the term the ramparts of Gog and Magog for the Wall of China. And, of course, we're the beneficiary of all the discoveries by the Soviet archaeologists who have found thousands of graves called Kurgans, frozen in the Siberia, where you've got 2,500-year-old graves that are frozen and therefore useful for understanding their lifestyle and the rest of it. But even if you didn't know any of this, we know that Magog is going to launch his attack from the uttermost parts of the north. And if you go north of Israel, obviously, you are in the southern steppes of Russia and so forth. The steppes of history, if I can use a pun here. See, the various descendants of Magog terrorized the southern steppes of Russia from the Ukraine all the way to China. And, uh, uh, and they did this from the 10th century B.C., to about the 3rd century B.C., for about seven centuries there. They were a very dominant factor in that geography. And the Great Wall of China was built to keep uh, Magog out, if you will. And so uh, there's a long history here. Going way back, there is a people called the Urartu in the 9th century B.C. This goes back a bit. A number of nomadic tribes created a new state in the region of Lake Van in present-day Turkey, which immediately became a competitor to the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians called this state Urartu, and it quickly became powerful in the first half of the 8th century BC. It extended its rule over a wide area. Now, Assyria could not stand by indifferently as Urartu expanded and grew more powerfully. Uh, so during the reign of a, a very key leader, the Assyrians undertook two campaigns against Uartu in, in the 8th century B.C. And um, two ca campaigns. In the second, they reached and besieged the Uartan capital of Tushba. And the uh, two groups frequently referred to in the Uartan texts and in the Assyrian text, the Sumerians and the Scythians. These two ancient peoples are surprisingly well documented in these things. They both figure very frequently in subsequent identifications. The Sumerians, they're the oldest of the European tribes living north of the Black Sea and the Danube, and we know them by the name that they used for themselves. And their history uh, of the southern Ukraine began in about the late 11th century BC, and they were the first specialized horse nomads to make their name in history. They were among the first people that domesticated the horse and created a horseback culture, if you will. And uh, the earliest skeletal evidence of domestication of the horse occurs south of Kiev about 2500 B.C. That really goes back a bit. And their nomadic lifestyle, including mounted warriors, fully developed between the 10th and 8th centuries. And uh, they were the first mentioned uh, in the secular literature, the Odyssey and the Iliad of Homer, 8th century B.C., and other cuneiform texts of the Assyrian Empire, and of course by Herodotus in detail. And Herodotus indicates the whole north step, uh, north uh, Pontic steppe region was, uh, was occupied in this time by the Scythians belonging to the Sumerians. And uh, scholars, in fact, suspect that the name Crimea for the Crimean Peninsula came from the Sumerians. And uh, they surged in Asia Minor in the late 7th century, annihilated the Phrygian uh, kingdom after destroying and looting its capital, Gordium, and uh, they captured Sardis and uh, plundered the Greek cities at the Aegean coast in Asia Minor. And in the early 7th century, Sumerian forces were checked and routed by the Assyrians who came to the aid of the Scythians. And by the 6th century, the Sumerians disappeared from the historical scene. By the 5th century, the Sumerians were driven south over the Caucasus by the Scythians. 
in a domino-like effect because the Scythians themselves were being pushed westward by other tribes. And all this can be co uh, coordinated with the Chinese records, interestingly enough. There are numerous references in the Talmud that have left little doubt that the descendants of Gomer then moved northward and established themselves in the Rhine and Danube valleys. The name Scythian then designates a number of nomadic tribes from the Russian steppes, one group of which invaded the Near East in the 8th and 7th century, and they're depicted in their legends, this is interesting, as descending from uh, Scythies, the youngest of three sons of Hercules, these are all fictitious people, uh, from sleeping with a half viper and half woman. It's interesting, notice how frequently a woman in the ancient mythology is linked with a serpent. I think that's kind of fascinating. Same thing, similar legends surrounded Alexander the Great and so forth. Anyway, after being repulsed from Media, many of the later Scythes settled in the fertile area of the Ukraine, north of the Black Sea. Other later tribes went to the east of the Caspian Sea. Herodotus then describes their own country called Scythia. It was a square, about 20 days journey, call it 360 uh, miles on a side. It encompassed the lower reaches of the Dniester, the Bug, the Dnieper, and the Don Rivers, where they flow into the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. The Scythian language belonged to the Iranian family of Indo-European languages. Deep roots here on both sides. The original area in which Iranian was spoken extended from mid-Volga to the Don regions uh, to the northern Urals and beyond. And from here, the Iranian-speaking tribes colonized Media, Parthia, Persia, Central Asia, as far as the Chinese border. The ancient writers, as I mentioned before, refer to the Great Wall of China as Sudyogog et Magog, the ramparts of Gog and Magog. And uh, so their speech is a form of Iranian, one of the branches of the Indo-European languages. They kept herds of horses, cattle, sheep, lived in tent-covered wagons, fought unexcelled in the use of bows and arrows on horseback. The Scythians developed archery to a level that's never been equaled. One of the trademarks of a Scythian warrior is that he could, while riding on horseback, bring down a bird in flight with his bow and arrow, left or right-handed. And uh, when a Scythian child could first walk, he was handed a bow. And they developed archery to a level of, uh, of competence and proficiency never equaled elsewhere. The Parthians tried to come close, but didn't make it. The Scyth when you see in a museum, if you see a vase with a, a, horse, a, a, a warrior rider riding, shooting an arrow backwards, and you might find a bird, maybe not, that's a, a, a symbol, a trademark, if you will, of the Scythian warrior and a very, very formidable people. They developed a very rich culture, uh, opulent tombs, metalwork, and a brilliant art style. Very, very interesting culture to study. In the 7th century, the Scythians advanced south of the Caspian Sea, invaded the kingdom of Media, but they were expelled in 625 by Xerxes, the king of Media. And shortly after the 4th century BC, the Scythians of southeastern Europe were subdued largely exterminated by the Samartians, which then gave their name to the region. So they're earlier than that. And uh, the Scythian tr tribes in Asia, however, invaded the Parthian Empire. That was the successor to the Persian Empire, southeast of the Caspian Sea in the 2nd century B.C. In about 130 B.C., they advanced eastward to the kingdom of Bactria, the region of the present-day Afghanistan. And in the 1st century B.C., they invaded western and northern India, where they remained powerful for about five centuries. So in the 7th century B.C., they swept across the area, displacing the Sumerians from the steppes of the Ukraine, east of Niper, who fled then across the Caucasus by way of summary. This is Herodotus' summary of it. Even the name Caucasus appears to have been derived from Gog Hassan, or Gog's fort. The, the, now, interesting, they, uh, the hippo Mogoi, they, they, milk, they milk horses for milk, are mentioned in Homer's Iliad. And uh, the, were the equestrian nomads of the northern steppes, several authorities identify these with Scythians. When I was, I had the opportunity to be the guest of the, uh, of, uh, the deputy chairman of the uh, Soviet Union. While uh, uh, with him, he extended to me uh, the, um, uh, one of the delicacies I was offered was fermented horse milk. So it seems these traditions have very, very deep roots indeed. According to both Herodotus and the archaeological evidence, Scythians occupied territory, for, territory from the Danube to the Don. The northern boundary extended beyond the latitude of Kiev in, in Russia. So this is... Now, tombs tell tales. The, Scythians, uh, the Scythian culture extended more than 2,000 miles east from the Ukraine. 
And this has been demonstrated by the sensational discovery in the Chilikta Valley of East Kazakhstan in 1965. And as the experts point out, they proved that the Scythian culture had spread to the Mongolian border as early as the 6th century BC. And uh, there are countless uh, Scythian burial sites that have been covered both north and east of the Black Sea, ranging from the 6th through the 2nd centuries. More than 1,200 graves have been investigated uh, by the institutes and so forth that specialize in this sort of thing. Uh, they're the ones that take care of Lenin's tomb and all that. And uh, the, these remarkable circumstances, because they're frozen tombs, um, they, they, they preserve the textiles, the remains of the horses, human skin, hair, entrails, undigested food, and so forth, for more than 2,300 years. So this allows the scientists to understand their lifestyle. They can tell what they ate and how they lived and so forth. They buried their horses with the warriors, by the way. So that's how that's such a, a relevant aspect. There is a concept that has its roots in the Scythians that you'll be interested to watch even to this day. It's a concept called defense in depth. One reason Herodotus gave us so much detailed information about the Scythians was that he wanted to describe the people who had succeeded in defeating the Persian king Darius. And Darius the first crossed the Bosphorus and invaded Scythia. The Scythians, however, had devised an unusual tactic for conducting warfare. The Persians expected to crush the Scythians in a decisive engagement. But the Scythians avoided such a battle. They retreated deep into their own territory, laying waste the region and wearing down the enemy by means of small raids. In pursuing the Scythians, Darius soon came to appreciate the cunning of these partisan tactics. Reaching the Volga, the Darius acknowledging defeat had to retreat from Scythia in shame. And Herodotus deals with this because the Greeks wanted to really understand that. Well, when you get to 1812, a guy by the name of Napoleon entered Russia. And Field Marshal Kutusov's similar strategy, even to the burning of Moscow, resulted in reducing Napoleon's Grand Armée from 453,000 down to 10,000. Because they just kept retreating, even leaving Moscow themselves burning as Napoleon goes there to receive the surrender. There's no one there to surrender. And he, it takes him a while to realize the ingenuity here because the Russian winter sets in. And he, could all, he, he, he was able to survive with a mere 10,000. And that whole uh, uh, event, that infamous defeat, is now commemorated in Tchaikovsky's Overture to 1812. That's really what it's all about, celebrating this. You say, well, don't they ever learn? You get to the World War II. 1941, Hitler suffered a similar defeat from the same Scythian strategy, pressing a quick advance deep into the Russian interior only to have his Wehrmacht swallowed up in the harsh Russian winter. What's that got to do today? We'll tell you in the next session because we're going to explore the current uh, Andropov doctrine in part two of this briefing. But that comes later. It's interesting that the Scythians are mentioned in the New Testament. Because Paul says in Colossians 3.11, he says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all in all. You and I don't relate to that verse because we don't have the cultural depth here. But a barbarian is one thing. The Scythian was used as the ultimate extreme of a barbarian. That word used this way would strike shock to the reader, to Paul's reader. And uh, because even a Scythian... Not only a barbarian, even a Scythian can uh, uh, receive Christ. So there's hope for us because you and I are in the same boat. We too can receive Christ no matter how Scythian we might be. The depth of the Scythian background has endowed the Russian people with the beauty of Pushkin, Dostoevsky, and Tchaikovsky on the one hand, but has also given them the cruelty of Ivan IV, the intensity of Lenin, and the brutality of Stalin as part of their heritage. Intense people and uh, incredible poetry, incredible art, incredible people. Well, let's talk about their allies. We've, we've tried to clarify and, and substantiate our identity of Magog with the Scythians. What about the allies that are listed in Ezekiel? Let's, remember we said, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. 
and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. That's actually Cush and Put in the original. And with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now that's an interesting phrase. In other words, Magog is not, going to, not only going to organize these allies, Magog is going to be the one that gives them the preparation, will provide the arms to them. Isn't that interesting? Be thou prepared, Magog, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee. Be thou a guard or a provider to them. So again, going back to the genealogy here, obviously Tubal and Meshach and Tubal are two mentioned by, by uh, uh, Ezekiel. Gomer is mentioned by Ezekiel. Cush and Put uh, are North Africa and the Dark Africa, respectively. And Elam, over in the she- line of Shem, is mentioned there. And uh, so, Japheth. Gomer, according to Herodotus and Plutarch and other writers, refers to the Sumerians settled along the Danube and the Rhine. We've talked about them already. Ashkenaz is a, a, and refers to a uh, root of Germany. Riphath is mentioned by Josephus. Interestingly enough, the name for Europe st- doesn't, it seems a little strange, but it's actually derived from Riphath. Tagarma refers to the Armenians. The Armenians to this day call themselves the House of Tagarma, but it would also include Turkey and Turkestan. And of course, Magon, the Scythians, we've, we've, I think, dealt with that with Hesiod and Herodotus and other, Philo, Josephus, and others. So, okay, Japheth uh, also has Medai, the Medes, which today are known as the Kurds. And uh, then we have Tubal and Meshech. Both of these were major, t- were not only individuals, but they also gave their name to ancient towns, uh, prim- prominent towns in eastern Anatolia, which today is Turkey. And uh, the, uh, the eastern two-thirds of Turkey is what used to be Anatolia. And, uh, and there are others here too. Yavin is Ionia, Greece, and those. Okay, we have under uh, the Yavin, we have, among others, we have Tarshish. We're going to talk more about Tarshish when we see them referred to specifically by Ezekiel. That takes care of Japheth, and let's talk about Shem, from, from whom comes Elam, Asher, Arphaxad. And Arphaxad is important to us as biblical uh, uh, students because from that line comes Selah, Eber, Peleg, and then um, uh, out of Peleg we have uh, eventually Abraham. So the line of Abraham traces itself back through Arphaxad, back to Shem. But uh, Aram being the Aramaic, uh, or what we would today call the Syrians, maybe. Um, but we have the main one here is Abraham from our point of view. But Elam is mentioned in Ezekiel as the principal, the first mentioned ally of the allies supporting Magog. So here we are. Here's the map. There's Israel. There's Magog to the north. And then we have Gomer, Meshach, Tubal, uh, all the rest of them uh, all joining in an attempt to invade Israel, but it's an attempt that's ill-fated because God himself is going to intervene. And of course, the lead of all these allies is Iran or Persia. We'll find there's two groups on the sidelines saying, hey, you guys shouldn't be doing that. Dedan and Sheba stand on the sidelines. We'll notice that as we get into the text here. But if you don't know all of that, we know that he comes from the north parts. Well, what's north of Israel? Obviously, the southern steppes of Russia. And that's where you, you can make that identity just geographically, if not ethnically. Well, let's continue Ezekiel's record here. He says, After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. There is that term. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword that is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. I'll come back to that word safely here in a little bit. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and the many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at that same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. 
And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest and dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. You see, I suspect Ezekiel never saw an unwalled village. Obviously, in today's world, we don't wall them in the typical thing, but that was not the style back then. But then he mentions two people here, Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take great spoil? Notice, interesting, Sheba and Dedan are not part of the invading force. They're on the sidelines saying, What are you guys doing? Well, Sheba and Dedan, most scholars would identify that with the region that's known today as Saudi Arabia. And the merchants of Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is a whole other interesting debate. Some people try to identify it with Spain and other places, but they haven't done enough homework. Tarshish, we know from 1 Kings 10 and Jeremiah 10 and Ezekiel 27, was a distant port from which silver, iron, tin, lead, ivory, monkeys, and peacocks were brought to Israel. Okay, it's a trading port of some kind, a very distant one. From the Akkadian, the word itself means to be smelted. So it, it seems to suggest tin more and more. Herodotus says it was beyond the pillars of Hercules, which are the entrance at Gibraltar, if you will. So that means it's beyond the Mediterranean, out into the Atlantic somewhere. Tarshish always had strong ships of capable of very long voyages. That's why Jonah tried to take a, sh a Tarshish ship to, to run away from his assignment. There's a concept called Britannia metal. Tarshish was an island over one year distant, we know, which was, among other things, a key source of tin. Britannia metal was an alloy of 93% tin, 5% antimony, and 2% copper. It was used for making utensils, uh, pot teapots, jugs, drinking vessels, candlesticks, urns, and official maces. It was similar in color to pewter, but it was harder, stronger, and easier to work than other alloys. So that's Britannia metal. Global commerce from Britain was confirmed by archaeological discoveries at Stonehenge. That was in the Bronze Age period. That's 1500 B.C. And we know that tin was exported to Europe in large quantities from Cornwall, England, during the Roman period. So this doesn't prove it, but it lends scholastic support to the idea that Tarshish may have been uh, in or uh, associated with the British Isles, strangely enough. Well, continuing here in Ezekiel 38, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, Thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days I will bring thee against my land. And the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Oh boy, you don't want to make God angry. And then we have introduced this great earthquake. Verse 19, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. But I'm going to suggest to you this isn't a normal earthquake. He says, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountain shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Now, this may be a natural disaster that God sets up to accomplish his purpose, but I can tell you frankly that there are warheads, 25 megaton warheads, not the usual 4 megatons that's a standard intercontinental ballistic missile warhead. There are 25 megaton warheads that have been built. 
and a few of those, if launched at the same time, would alter the orbit of the Earth. So this could be, not necessarily, but could be a weapons effect we're seeing here. God continues, I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. Saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. Then I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. A very repetitive phrase in the writings of Ezekiel. He continues in the next chapter, Therefore, son, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. What it says in the Hebrew is, I will sixth thee. We have an, a, a similar expression in the English. We say, I'm going to decimate you. Technically, it means I'll divide you into tenths. What it really means, I'm going to wipe you out. And I think that's what's here, too. He's not saying I'm going to divide you down to one sixth. He's saying, I'm going to sixth thee. I'm going to, I'm going to decimate you if I'm going to put it in the metric system, all right? Okay. I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand. I will cause thy arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord. And I will send a fire on Magog, and upon them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them pollute my name anymore. My, I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. My people Israel. You see, God is openly acting on behalf of Israel here. Which is one of the reasons that many of us believe that this event occurs after the rapture of the church. That's one of the several reasons we hold that view. It's an, and I won't take the time here to defend that view. Many good scholars don't share that view. But that's one of the reasons we note that this is God is openly acting. In the book of Esther and also where God acts on behalf of Israel, but invisibly behind the scenes. And indeed, he's working with Israel today, but it's invisible behind. This is quite different. Now, there's another thing here that's a little disturbing. I will send fire on Magog. Okay, we get the picture. We've read it so now. But then he says something else here. I'll send fire upon Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. Carelessly in the isles. That word in the Hebrew is batash, which means in false confidence. They're obviously not safely. They think they're safe, but they're not. It's dealing here with a group of people that are in the isles or the remote coastlands. We don't know where that is. But they also somehow are going to get hit here. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the next session. But I don't want the vocabulary that we've encountered to confuse you. The word sus in the Hebrew is translated horse, but what it actually means is a leaper. A horse ridden by a knight in battle would leap through. It was a major, major advantage if you were uh, uh, obviously mounted on a horse. But it's called a leaper. That word in the Hebrew can mean bird. It does so in Jeremiah 8 verse 7. It can even refer to a chariot rider in Exodus 14.9. This could very well simply be 2,500-year-old language that can be describing a mechanized force. We call motorized infantry today cavalry, even today. If you go and look at an army org chart, you'll see, and you'll see armor, that's the big guns that are tracked, and you find cavalry, which are mechanized infantry. So that vocabulary, don't let the vocabulary of the ancient Hebrew confuse you. If you visit Israel's tank center at Latrun, you'll get a chance to examine 200 different tanks, but you'll also uh, see their main battle tank, which is the Merkava which is the Hebrew word for chariot. So don't let the ancient vocabulary fool you. In fact, you'll find the word cherub, which is for sword. The word sword has widely become a generic term for any weapon. He that takes up the sword, meaning taking up a weapon, not necessarily a, a bladed instrument today. The word cutis means arrow. What it actually can be is a javelin or anything that pierces. 
It's occasionally used for a thunderbolt. It could be translated, if you chose, today as a missile, a piercing, a piercing thing. Kasheth means bow, but it's really what just launches the katis. So if you're translating Hebrew in 1611 under King James I of England, you, you might translate it the way it reads in your Bible. If you and I today were translating Ezekiel 39 verse 3, we could legitimately render it, quote, I will smite your launchers out of your left hand and cause your missiles to fall out of your right. Want a couple of other thoughts here. Not in the Ezekiel passage, but you might be interested to see what happens in a Jeremiah passage in this regard in terms of vocabulary. In Jeremiah 50, he's talking about an attack against Babylon, yet future. For lo, I will raise and cause up to, uh, come up against Babylon a, a, an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence shall she be taken. Their arrows, this is the part I want you to pay attention to. From thence she, 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 she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. Now, you will miss that in the English, but the word arrow, of course, is katis. That's it's anything shot from an engine of war or shot by a bow or a hand. In the Greek rendering by the Septuagint, it's a missile or anything thrown like an arrow or a javelin. And that can be, of course, other kinds of arrows today. But it says, as of a mighty expert in your English. It, the Hebrew term is sakal. The point, in the Hebrew, and by the word, the sakal means to be prudent, to be circumspect, to widely understand or prosper. But here in this, in this sentence in the Hebrew, it's a hefil participle masculine singular absolute. What does that mean? That means it's the arrow, not the shooter, that has the insight, that gives attention to, considers, ponders, that is prudent, that has comprehension. It's not the shooter, it's the arrow. In the Septuagint, it says that the arrow is intelligent, possessing understanding. The New American Standard says that their arrows shall be like an expert warrior who does not return empty-handed. Their arrows will be like skilled warriors who do not return empty-handed. The point I'm getting at, in the Hebrew, it's emphatic that the intelligence is in the arrow, not the shooter. In fact, in the English, you can even pick it up at the final phrase, None shall return in vain. Not only is the intelligence in the arrow, it can't miss. It can't miss. So this is what we would call today a smart weapon. Another thing you find in the scripture is the description of the neutron bomb, a, nu a nuclear weapon that's been tuned to attack protein, not real estate. In, in Zechariah 14, 12, this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have come against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. This could refer to a lot of other things too, but it certainly is very descriptive if anyone is familiar with what neutron bombs are designed to do. Well, that concludes our first session here. In our next session, we're going to talk about the technologies that are enumerated by Ezekiel. We're going to talk about the strange cleanup of the battle. We will also review Magog and his allies today. Who are these people? What are they doing today? We'll talk about the Antropov Doctrine in Russia that many of you may not be familiar with and what the current trends are. And then we'll also deal with some timing issues that are certainly are not free of controversy. But that's for our next session.